So, uh, welcome here tonight at the uh, first event for the, the Electrical Electronic uh, Division. Um, this is a joint event with the uh, Energy Division, Energy and Environment Division. And it's a talk on flywheel battery hybrid uh, and controls for grid stabilization. So tonight's event is also available on webcast uh, where you can click the, the join event button uh, online accessing through the, the Engineers Ireland uh, webpage. And I've been informed that um, we'll be taking Q&As at the end of the, the discussions, but also Q&As from anybody who's joining us on, on webcast. And the, um, the email to email to us for those Q&As is engineerswebcast at gmail.com for those joining us on webcast. Um, so some housekeeping there. I'm not aware of any uh, fire drills, so if a uh, fire alarm goes off, uh, please proceed to the emergency exits. There's one over here and do so in an orderly fashion. Um, if you can, turn off your mobile phones and uh, uh, to show respect for the, the speakers. Um, uh, tonight, tonight, as I said, was a, a joint event there for the with the Energy and Environment Division, and is one of much interest for the, the significant challenges facing the grids with increased renewables and system non-synchronous uh, penetration. Traditionally, heavy conventional steam turbines and generators have provided stability to the electric grid, and as more and more electricity is provided in a non-synchronous renewable generators such as PV. Um, there are less conventional generators running and providing that stability. Schwangrad Energia Limited has built the hybrid flywheel battery plant in Road County Offaly, designated an air grid demonstration project to prove the capability of such plant to provide system services to stabilise the grid. The control system supplied by Yokogawa is a crucial component uh, for this capability. This lecture, lecture will describe the hybrid plant and control system and its capabilities in providing system services. So a little bit about our speakers tonight. Uh, thanks for, for joining us. Uh, Frank Burke uh, is a chartered engineer. Frank has an honours degree in electrical uh, engineering in UCD. He has worked for 42 years in the electricity industry in Ireland and has extensive experience in the electricity markets, having been involved from the start in the development of various markets in Ireland over the last 20 years. He is now a technical director of Schwangrad Energia Limited. Uh, he is a fellow of Engineers Ireland. Donald has a master's, Donald Burke has a master's uh, degree uh, in information systems management from NUI Galway. His work with Yokogawa brings cross industry uh, sector experience with projects in oil and gas, power generation and pharmaceuticals. He is country manager for Yokogawa in Ireland and business unit manager for their advanced solutions business in the UK and Ireland. Uh, and I'd like to give them a, a warm welcome for uh, tonight, please, if you can. Um, just on the format, Frank is going to talk for about 20, 25 minutes. Uh, Donald is going to talk for 20 minutes and then we might hold the, the Q&A afterwards. Bernice Doyle of the Energy and uh, Environment di Division will be uh, hosting the, the Q&A session. So without further ado, I'll hand you over there to Frank. Thank you. Thanks very much, Carl. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the overview of what we're going to talk about, the first question is what problem are we solving? And um, as this is Engineers Ireland, I presume most of you are engineers, and if like, like, like me when I was in college, um, it was drummed into us that engineering is all about problem solving, and the first thing you do when you try and solve a problem is define the problem. And it's amazing how often we don't actually define the problem. So the first thing I'm going to do tonight is define the problem that we're trying to solve. Uh, and Schwungrad Energy was set up really specifically to solve that particular problem. Okay, so I'll say a few words about uh, Schwungrad. And then I'll talk about the pilot project that we have enrolled. Um, and I'll describe the technologies we have and then talk about the, um, the applications of those technologies. So what is the problem we're trying to solve? Um, yeah, sorry, that's fine. Um, Ireland, because it's got a, a very high target of uh, renewable energy and it's already, um, it's already up over the 20% 
um, of actual renewable electricity. Um, that means that at times uh, there's over 50% of the electricity coming into the grid would be from, from renewables. And that causes problems for the stability of the grid. Uh, now, it's a particular problem in Ireland because not only do we have that high percentage of renewables, but also we're not very well interconnected and the interconnections we do have are DC. So the actual grid is relatively small. You can take countries like Denmark that have a, a lot more renewable generation, but they're much better interconnected to other countries via AC. So their, their effective grid size is huge in comparison um, to the grid size in Ireland. So that's why we in Ireland are seeing this particular problem that other countries are be only beginning to see. And a lot of the countries haven't really, I think, grasped what the issues are. Um, renewable generation gives rise to two problems. Um, first of all, it's intermittent. Um, and it's unpredictable in its output. And I think everybody is aware of that. And that requires storage over a, a time frame of many hours. So at times the wind is blowing, at times it's not, at times the sun is shining, and at times it's not. Uh, but the other problem is that there's a lack of inertia or grid stability. And that requires a different kind of storage. And that's really the storage that, that we are attempting. That's the problem we're attempting to, um, to solve in Schwungrad with what we have in our demonstration project. Uh, and this l last point uh, just shows uh, how big an issue storage is. But most of that storage is storage on the, the first point about the intermittent and unpredictability of the, uh, the renewable output. Rather, and it's only, it's only now that uh, the storage coming in for the second problem, which is about grid stability. So what exactly is this issue about grid stability? Um, as Carl read out in, in, in the little piece that I, I wrote as an introduction to this, um, the stability at the moment is provided by conventional plant. So you've got big heavy steam turbines, big heavy generators that are synchronized to the grid. And they're sort of thundering around and they can ride through the bumps. So if something happens on the system, and let's say a unit, a large generation unit, um, trips off the system, the system frequency will, will slow down. And as it slows down, all these heavy machines are going to slow down. And they will give up, automatically they will give up their kinetic energy into electrical energy and, and, and bring the system frequency back up. But PV won't do that, and neither will wind. So as there's more and more renewable on the system, there is less room for these heavy generators to provide that sort of stability. And that's really why you need new plants that will come in that will specifically provide that kind of stability and, and will be able to inject power very rapidly into the system. At the moment, the grids sometimes run generators at minimum generation because they need the inertia that, that those generators provide. But when they bring those generators on, they have to turn down the wind, right? So they're curtailing the wind. Now, that's not a major problem at the moment, but it gets to a kind of a critical point or a tipping point, whereas there's more and more wind and PV on the system, that will become a more serious problem. And if they continue to have to run those generators at minimum generation, they would be curtailing the wind and the PV a lot more. So, so batteries and flight wheels will provide that sort of stability. Uh, you can see in the graph there, um, that the system frequency is going up and down within a certain band. And there's a, there's a point here um, where the system frequency takes a, a big drop. And that's not a problem that a lot of um, other countries have because they're so well interconnected. Uh, but it's a problem that they will have in the future because that interconnection with countries that can absorb uh, that, that, can, um, that can provide that inertia that will stop that uh, drop in the system frequency, those countries will have more and more renewables as well, and they will have less of that heavy plant that's providing the, the stability. So this problem that Ireland has at the moment, other countries will have um, in the next sort of five to ten years. So Svungrad Energy was, was set up, you know, specifically with this sort of issue and seeing this, I suppose, market opportunity. 
um, and some of the people were uh, looking at this as far back as 2012, but the company was formally established at the end of 2013. Um, we're a team of energy experts. There's a couple of us at CSB. Um, there are other people who are entrepreneurs and have set up lots of other businesses. Um, and there's people that have a speciality in project management and environmental planning and so on. So we're quite a diverse group. Um, somebody, somebody said that um, if they go to look at a, a new startup company, if it's got more than two engineers, that um, you know, there's kind of worries about that, because as engineers we tend to be too technical and we all think kind of the same way that you need a diversity. So we have a reasonable diversity in the company. Um, so we've identified this sort of uh, growing demand for um, plants that doesn't provide energy and therefore won't curtail the renewables, but yet can provide that stability to the grid. Uh, so we're targeting the Irish market first under this um, the air grids uh, DS3 program. Um, we're also looking in uh, in Great Britain. They have a, a new product that which they call uh, enhanced frequency regulation, and they recently went out to tender and they got over 200 megawatts, um, mainly of lithium-ion batteries, to provide this enhanced uh, frequency regulation. When they, when they went out initially um, uh, for expressions of interest, they got something like 1,300 megawatts um, of interest. Now, a lot of that fell away, but they still had no problem in getting over 200 megawatts, which is what their target was in this first round for enhanced frequency regulation. So you can see that this is a, this is a, 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 a bigger and bigger issue, um, and the markets are growing to accommodate that. Um, we've also set up a joint venture in, in, um, in China, and um, there's been some interest from Vietnam as well. Uh, so what have we been doing? Uh, if the first couple of years was really looking at um, what sort of plant we should use. Uh, should we use flywheels? Should we use batteries? If so, what kind of batteries? What kind of flywheels? And we, we looked around the market at, at, um, at different flywheels and we, we, uh, we decided on the Beacon flywheels in the US because they have a lot of experience and those flywheels were designed specifically for the power industry. Uh, then in 2015, last year, was really, I suppose, when it all came together, when we, we got some finance uh, from Enterprise Ireland and from SEAI, and um, we put a lot of, the company put a lot of its own finance in, um, and we, we built the demonstration project and roads. Last year, we installed the flywheels and commissioned the flywheels, and then we installed and commissioned the batteries in the early part of this year. So this is a demonstration project um, with Airgrid, and um, glad to see Airgrid here. Um, and uh, and we're, we're, we've we've done most of the testing at this stage. We have we have three different modes of control, and we've tested two of them. We're just starting to test the third one now. So we're kind of at the stage of um, beginning to sit down and 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 write the the report. And then next year and the year after, um, we'll be going into uh, the sort of commercialization stage. And we're also looking at, at other applications for this technology as well. And I'll, I'll say a few words about that later on. Um, the pilot project, uh, I mentioned Beacon Power are the, the people who um, have provided the flywheels. Uh, Hitachi Chemical have provided the, uh, the, the batteries, they're lead acid batteries, and the reason we chose lead acid batteries is that because the market here is looking for plants that's basically just sitting there ready and waiting to inject power into the system when the system frequency falls, that only happens maybe 30, 40 times a year. So there aren't a huge number of cycles, so you don't need that can have you know um, tens of thousands of cycles. Um, all our projects um, are the people who actually did the, the installation and are involved with Schwungrad, some of the same people in our projects are involved with Schwungrad. Um, we've got funding from the EU and Horizon 2020. Um, most of the funding came from Enterprise Ireland and SEAI. Um, the, uh, it's a demonstration project with Airgrid. The uh, control systems have been provided by Yoko Gawa and Donnie will be talking about that shortly. And the University of Limerick are involved as well because it's a, an innovation partnership um, program. 
So they have provided the um, you know some some research facilities for that. It's in um, Road in County Offaly on part of what was the old um, ESB Road power station. Um, and there's two beacon flywheels, 160 kilowatts each. Um, the the, uh, the flywheels can provide full output for five minutes and then reducing output um, from full output down to zero over the following uh, 10 minutes. So it provides half the output at a constant power. Um, and then the batteries, the lead acid batteries, 160 kilowatts and um, 576 kilowatt hours. There's more kilowatt hours in it than we really need, but um, that was just the way the, the, the batteries came. So we could run those for um, over an hour and only uh, have a depth of discharge of 30%. And we're connected into the local um, ESB network at medium voltage at 20 kV. And I, I've mentioned the, uh, the funding that we've got. So this is just the bit, the bit in the middle of that is the uh, an aerial view of the uh, of the site, and you can see here the uh, the flywheels are the blue. You can just see the top of the the flywheels. The flywheels uh, they they spin on a vertical axis, and they're about two meters in diameter. Most of it is actually underground. You're just looking at the top of the flywheels there. So there's a uh, um, a foundation that goes down into the ground is basically a big concrete pipe, um, a little bit more sophisticated than that, and the flywheel goes down into that, and is, is better than that. Um, you can see that in the in the in the cutout in the cutout here. Okay, um, the flywheel itself uh, has a, a, a composite ring. Uh, that's really where the kinetic energy is stored. It's very, you know, there's a, there's a huge mass in that, and it spins at maximum speed at 16,000 RPM. So that's really where the kinetic energy, that's where the energy is stored. It's got uh, magnetic bearings, and it's, um, it's in a vacuum. It's in a very strong vacuum. So the losses are very low on it, okay? Um, the, uh, on the other side, then, you can see the... Uh, the, the uh, the battery building here. Um, we built a building for the batteries because we didn't know at that stage who was going to provide the batteries and whether it would be in a container or in a building. So we we put we put up the building, and the Hitachi batteries then are are, are in the left hand part of it. Or the right hand part is where we have the uh, power control system, uh, and we have a control room as well. And um, here here you have the the ESB. Uh, well, there's the ESP substation, so the ESP part of it, and then our equipment, all our um, low voltage and medium voltage um, breakers and so on are in that. And then here we have the uh, the transformer. Uh, because the Beacon flywheels are American, their standard voltage is 480 volts, whereas ours is 400 volts. So we just have two toppings of the transformer, one at 480 volts and one at 400 volts. And then the uh, that's just a cutout of the the lead acid the lead acid batteries. Um, I'll I'll just say a few other words. We we the the um, in the control room. Uh, there's a cluster controller for the uh, the beacon flywheels. So it's a single controller for the two flywheels. You could have a cluster of say five or ten flywheels and. Uh, they would all operate in in unison, okay. Um, um, so there's the controller for that. These um, these parts here are the power control modules for the beacon flywheel. Each beacon flywheel is um, self-contained, so it's each of them has their own um, power control module, and they uh, they have a a uh, just a cooler there as well for cooling the IGBTs and for cooling the flywheel. Um, and on the battery side, um, with the batteries on, on one side, it has its own control, its own um, uh, PCS, which is on the other side, and then that's controlled uh, from the control room. And then the Yokogawa control system um, is is at the, the next level, and it it sends its signals to the beacon control system, which sends it out to the individual flywheels and to the um, uh, Freecon. Who provided the the PCS for the batteries? So the, the, there's a 
there's the, the Yokogawa control system and then there's the beacon um, for the flywheels and then the battery control system underneath that. So why do we use a mixture of uh, flywheels and batteries? The, the reason really is that um, flywheels have an almost infinite number of cycles, um, whereas the batteries are limited in that. Whereas the flywheels have a limit to the amount of energy you can store on them, whereas the batteries can, can last for longer. So when we put the two of them together, we, we have a, a, a very good synergy between those two, so that we have uh, the, the, the almost li limitless um, a number of, of cycles in the flywheels and as much energy for as long as we want in, in the batteries. Okay? And that's really what, what, uh, what they did, this, this is saying here. Okay? Um, so it's uh, you know kinetic energy in the flywheel and it's uh, chemical energy in the batteries and the, the flywheels are more high power and the batteries can provide high power but they can also provide high energy, ex extended energy and they're really designed for the system services market in Ireland which is this TS3 market from, from Airgrid and the particular products that they will pay for, so because this obviously has to be commercial. And you might have a different hybrid in a different country that required different system services or that paid for different things. So we have lead acid batteries in Ireland. We might use lithium ion or flow batteries or some other kind of batteries in a different country if the application was different, okay, if the requirements were different. You can see here the system services that's so we can provide frequency regulation. Now, there's no payment in Ireland at the moment for frequency regulation, although under the DS3, there, there is um, one of the, one of the, um, what do they call it, the factors, uh, multiplying factors on the payments, um, does have a, a thing in there depending on uh, how big of a dead band you have around the frequency before you respond. So if you make the dead band zero, then you'll get more money than if you have a bigger dead band. So there is some recognition of the value of, um, of uh, frequency, frequency regulation. And in many countries, frequency regulation is something that's paid for, and that's really where the flywheels come into their own. Um, so we can provide the, um, um, that frequency regulation and response in less than one second. So we get an uplift on the fast frequency response. And then we, we have the uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary one uh, reserves. Tertiary one goes out to five minutes. Tertiary two goes from five minutes out to 20 minutes. So we can get that from the batteries. So it gives us an extra, uh, the range of system services that we can provide. So how does the flywheel um, storage work? Uh, there's a motor generator at the bottom. Um, coming back to coming back to this, you can see at the at the very bottom there's a motor generator there. So it we we take power from the system. We speed up the flywheel up to 16,000 rpm. We basically just leave it there running at 16,000 rpm. Um, and then if the uh, if the system if the system needs more power, um, we will sense that the system frequency has, has fallen and we will, or through the control algorithms that we have built, we will inject power into the system so it will basically suck the power out of the flywheel, converting the kinetic energy into electrical energy and putting it into the, into the system as electrical energy. Um, and I think I've, I've, I've mentioned the other points before. So the controls, the controls are a very um, important part of this uh, of this demonstration project. Um, we developed uh, the control algorithms uh, in conjunction with Airgrid because effectively Airgrid are a customer for this, and we, we, we set out with three different control modes. And you know, I drew them out and then talked to Airgrid, and they said, "Well, you know, it'd be better if you did this or that," and and, and we modified them. Um, and we're providing both frequency response and we're also providing um, voltage control. So we have control algorithms that will inject kilovars or absorb kilovars um, from the system to uh, control the voltage and we have, we have, we have three different control modes on the voltage side. Um, 
unfortunately were not actually in the demonstration uh, allowed to inject power because uh, we're, we're injecting it onto the ESB networks and there's customers on that and they're afraid that we'd put the voltage up if we injected power. Uh, or sorry, injected um, 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 VARs onto the system so we can really only uh, test um, the, the voltage control in the other one. Um, there's two things really that, that we're looking for and that AirGrid are looking for. One is how quickly can we respond and the second is can we sustain that response long enough, okay? So um, we, uh, AirGrid have provided us a disturbance recorder and we can we can measure down to you know um, hundreds of milliseconds or less than that down to say 20 milliseconds um, and we have shown that we have responded up to full load in well under one second which is a very fast response from the time that the system frequency starts to take a drop so i mentioned that um you know there's other applications for uh, a hybrid of flywheels and batteries apart from uh, providing system services to the grid um i mean initially we're targeting this ds3 market in ireland and the enhanced frequency regulation market in in, um, in gb um, but there are also other applications in terms of co-locating with either existing plant existing um thermal plant, generation plant, or also um, new plant, particularly renewables. Uh, in terms of the existing plant, sometimes existing plants have difficulty in, in providing the system services they need, and they can either modify it to provide more system services, or they can bring in flywheels and or batteries to provide those system services. Um, the bigger market is probably really in terms of the renewable generators, and with ISEM coming in, and the requirement for renewable generators to actually provide what they predict they're going to provide in a, a certain settlement period, then there is, a, there is a value to firmness, there's a value to them being able to actually provide what they say they'll provide in a, in a, in a particular um, trading period. Um, so uh, storage uh, of energy is useful from that point of view um, down to the sort of the half hour trading period. Um, so batteries would really be the thing rather than flywheels in that particular application. There's a number of other applications too um, um, where, where we see uh, an opportunity for um, a mixture of flywheels and batteries. One of the things that's interesting is that um, the, the variation in output from PV is much more rapid than the variation in output from, um, from wind. You know, wind tends to vary you know, slowly, relatively slowly. Uh, and there's a certain amount of inertia in the wind machines, whereas PV, a cloud comes over and suddenly the, the, the output dips down or the cloud passes and the output goes up again. So, you know, there's, again, there's different horses for courses and different kinds of dynamic storage that were useful in depending on, 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 um, on what, you're, what you have them with, whether you have them with PV or with wind. So in terms of full-scale commercialization, um, we see that like this is an issue that we're seeing now before 2020 but as as targets for renewables increase beyond 2020 to 2030 and 2050 and talk about having almost completely green electricity and um, these issues are going to become much bigger not only here but right around the world so there's an increasing need for this sort of dynamic storage to stabilize the grid and the value of those system services are beginning to be recognized around the world. I mean, certainly with DS3 here and with the, the new enhanced frequency regulation in GB. And in other markets, there are, there are other ways of recompensing people for providing those uh, stability services. Um, and, and also there's a, there's a market for more firm output um, from renewables to reduce the exposure to the volatile uh, imbalance market. Um, the long-term contracts we would see as being the cheapest way to provide, um, to provide these sorts of services. And certainly when renewable generation came into Ireland first, it came in through these um, AER contracts, alternative energy requirement contracts, and they were long-term 15-year contracts that were given out and people bid in and because people bid in people bid in and they knew they were getting a long-term contract so they could raise the, f the funds from the banks they bid in very competitively and ireland had extremely cheap renewable generation compared to 
um, the UK or compared to a lot of other countries that had different mechanisms for supporting it. So we would say that, that long-term contracts are very important to bring in um, new, new technologies that are required, a new plant that's required to allow the amount of renewable energy onto the system that's going to be needed to meet the targets in 2020 and then 2030 and 2050. Um, and also energy storage is different to other plant and requires uh, specific grid codes and permitting and so on. At the moment it's kind of lumped in with, with wind and, and other technologies that use um, power electronics between it and, and the grid. So just in conclusion, um, there's very specific issues about integrating renewable generation and we're seeing those in Ireland before other countries. Flywheel battery hybrid sort of marries two technologies um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that makes the best of both of them and that each of them counteracts the limitations of the other. Um, and a um, little plug for Schoengrad, we're at the, the forefront of, of this with um, of flywheels and battery hybrids and we have um, built this first um, demonstration project in Europe. Um, the markets are beginning to develop um, that would support these sort of projects. Um, but a lot more work needs to be done on that and there's a huge potential worldwide for these. So that's me done. Thank you very much. Um, this your one? Uh, I think so. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Frank. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Um, I'll just focus on the uh, under control and information technologies. Uh, Frank briefly mentioned uh, uh, what our scope was in the project. Um, I, initially, I'll give you a brief overview of who Yokogawa Yoko are to put it in context as to why, um, why we're involved in this project. Then I'll look at the, the, some of the key high-level requirements from Schongrad for the control and information technologies deployed on the plant. Um, thereafter, I'll talk about some of the constraints uh, with R&D projects when it comes to uh, the unknowns and uh, finances, and then look at uh, the delivered technologies and also uh, the system architectures and future vision for the commercialised plants. Um, so Yokogawa, just uh, a couple of key facts about Yokogawa, we're a Japanese company, as you may tell from the, from the name. Uh, we're just over 100 years old, headquartered in Tokyo. Um, we provide, we manufacture and provide uh, measurement control and information technologies and the associated engineering and services of those uh, uh, technologies to process industry predominantly, uh, oil and gas, power gen, chemical, uh, pharmaceutical industries and we provide services throughout the complete life cycle of those plants uh, from the technologies right through to the service and the consultancy related to the deployment and service of those technologies. As I said we're headquartered in Tokyo we've 20,000 employees worldwide uh, 92 affiliates in 59 countries uh, providing local support to our clients in the regions. Uh, in terms of our skilled engineers and knowledge base, uh, we've over 4,000 uh, project engineers out of the 20,000 employees in 38 engineering centres globally. And uh, additionally, we have over 1,000 uh, uh, experienced solution consultants with, uh, which specialise in the areas of process consultancy, uh, cyber security, uh, and uh, advanced process control in uh, uh, those areas of the business. Um, as would be expected for a, a technology company supplier as ourselves providing these services, we have 24-7, um, 365 uh, um, support services around the clock globally with uh, global response centres in each of the uh, key regions and over 2,000 customer service engineers supporting. So for the Schwungrad project, I suppose the, the high level requirements, the key requirements from Schwung, uh, Schwungrad for the control information technologies were that they need a real time control and operation of the plant, including secure remote operations. Most of the requirements um, 
they needed information technology to record the plant performance, key data, KPI analysis, um, remote engineering capability, and uh, a PLC which could uh, provide the services which uh, the, the uh, uh, to respond to the frequency events, uh, to process the signals, and to uh, provide the uh, the control output in less than 100 milliseconds. Most of the key requirements on this uh, were to provide these services for a facility which would be predominantly unmanned most most of the time. Uh, so operators are uh, responding to uh, alarm outputs or, or information that they're getting via their mobiles or uh, 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 via email and that so most of the Shungrad personnel uh, would be unmanned so it was it was key that the uh, the technologies could provide that facility in a secure fashion. I suppose the key challenges uh, with any R&D project is that uh, you know you have some funding constraints uh, which can have a, a constraint on resources the application and functional developments of the, the system you want to deploy everything but it's you know you, you have a limitation of budget and, and yet uh, there's a lot of unknowns and how you how you manage those and how you can manage variations as they as they develop um, because of the unknowns there's a lot of functional design uncertainty when it comes to how the application needs to be developed so, uh, the technologies that Frank spoke about in terms of beacon the proven technologies the beacon flywheel as Frank has said has uh, has uh, been deployed predominantly in peak shaving applications if I'm correct uh, originally uh, and that and uh, um, we these technologies are proven in, in, in different applications and when you integrate these into a hybrid environment no one's as to how how this integration and how the functional specification will work out so um, so they're being deployed in a new service delivery model which uh, during the design and during development and testing stage evolves in terms of uh, defining those requirements some of the technical challenges uh, uh, that we experienced, I suppose, on the project, uh, predominantly related to proprietary communication protocols. Uh, the cluster controller itself um, had a, a, a proprietary communication protocol, which was a non-industry standard, which we uh, had to develop uh, for the project then for our PLC to communicate directly with the uh, cluster controller. The, um, I suppose, looking at all of these requirements and uh, um, the uh, the challenges uh, we had to come up with a solution then that would provide Schwungrad with uh, the uh, uh, the key solution for their operational and both their business performance because the information system is critical to ensure that uh, the data the analysis that they're getting in terms of the performance of the plant supports a commercial model going forward. So we had to then align Yokawa as a technology developer. We have several. Uh, uh, control and information technologies within our portfolio so we had to best align what we felt uh, could meet the requirements from Shungrad's perspective. So how we deployed that was we used the FAM3 uh, uh, controller for for uh, the master plant controller so as Frank said the control modes for the, the plant are deployed, the algorithms are deployed within this controller why we chose this was that the actual controller itself can process control inputs on the CPU at 100 microseconds and it can execute 100 steps in the program within 100 nanoseconds. Uh, it's a very fast PLC uh, uh, so it provides the, there's obviously other links within the chain uh, communicating with the cluster controller and that so by the time you integrate those technologies that you're, you're not realizing the uh, the uh, 100 nanoseconds however you are coming in as Frank said in, in, in most cases well well below the one millisecond uh, uh, within uh, 100 or a few hundred milliseconds response the addressing the security and the remote uh, operations requirements uh, we deployed uh, are proven um, SCADA platform. Uh, this uh, provides secure operations in terms of uh, uh, remote um, 
remote clients first one grant to access the plant remotely and operate and see how it is performing. We provide uh, a secure VPN tunnel between the site and um, Schwungrad's control centre, um, and uh, we provide uh, TLS data encryption from within FAST tools to allow the secure transfer of data between those sites. On the site as well, we have a Cisco ASA firewall to control the inbound and outbound, uh, outbound traffic from, from the site. The SCADA designed to ISA 99 or now the IEC 682443 standard uh, with respect to uh, uh, network uh, security for industrial control systems. Uh, the web HMI clients provide the facility to allow Schwungrad to remotely operate the plant, but if necessary also to provide uh, remote engineering on the facility, so any modifications or changes that are required in, within the, the SCADA layer. Um, for the data analysis, we provided our data historian, which extracts the performance data from the system and allows one grad then to perform reports and KPI analysis to ascertain how the plant is performing and to run their own modeling on uh, different scenarios. So, with respect to the architecture, then it's a, this is just a high level architecture of how the plant is structured. So at uh, the ISA 99 level one uh, section of the architecture, we have the plant master controller, which interfaces with the, the beacon cluster controller, the power conversion system uh, for the battery and the uh, substation. So the main control algorithms developed by Frank uh, Schwungrad and uh, Airgrid are deployed within the uh, plant master controller. Then at level two at the plant, we have the uh, uh, engineering and operator workstation and uh, an OPC server and firewall, which deploys the uh, information to the remote clients at the remote operation center. Um, and the data historian is held at site where, where uh, further analysis is performed by uh, Schwungrad. Going forward with the uh, with the, the Schungrad vision, and their, uh, I think they've been very innovative in terms of the deployment of their technologies, and they're uh, continuing that innovation with their future vision in terms of how the commercial plant models may work and how the uh, supporting technologies might be developed. Um, and uh, the the future vision would be to, I suppose, embrace the. Uh, the industrial internet of things in, in, in deploying secure cloud-based uh, SCADA platforms and, uh, um, and uh, uh, operational intelligence platforms such as the data historian and that. Um, by deploying these in a secure off-site um, environment, a cloud-based environment, you are reducing the level of risk in terms of having your operational systems on servers within uh, that is unmanned that may be hard to get to from a service perspective so uh, having it in a in a in a data center uh, in one of our secure data centers having replication and redundancy means that we can facilitate 100 percent uptime and guarantee that the performance of the underlying hardware technology that supports the software systems will uh, will deliver every time uh, and additionally, uh, uh, data as a service application platforms for uh, uh, technology partnering. So any of the key technology partners um, have this facility then to see how their underlying assets are performing on the plant and raise, uh, see any, the, 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 any uh, key issues that may be raised or are happening at that time so they can do statistical analysis through the data as a service application platform or additionally provide information that the TSO may require uh, through this platform also and it's a com collaborative framework application that allows us to do that. So that's the future vision, that's uh, essentially uh, the, the automation architecture that I suppose delivers the, uh, the operational uh, strategy for uh, for Schwungrad and uh, that concludes my my part of the presentation thank you, thank you.
taking some questions and just to repeat for anyone who's watching us um, online you can email questions through to engineerswebcast at gmail.com gmail yeah so um carl might just check in on those they're going through on there nothing is yet um, no. nothing yet okay uh so yeah uh, questions from anyone you might just give us your name and your uh, organization affiliations before you start this one over here. Hello. <coughs> Hi, John Turner, ESPI. Um, very interesting technology and so on, and best of luck with it. Absolutely. And uh, now I understand the basic, you know, framework that you're describing, Frank was describing in particular, and like, uh, you know, the market rules are changing, like flexibility is becoming very important, storage, rapid response, all that. Um, commercially, and you mentioned the long-term contracts, and I understand the, the reason for it, the, the argument for it and so on, but where is that with the, with, um, with the authorities in terms of, you know, are they gonna, is there going to be allowed to offer long-term contracts to, to kind of, you know, build up a portfolio of, of private storage providers like yourselves? Okay, yeah, that's good. It's a good question. Um, under the DS3, um, there are now interim tariffs for this year, for um, from October this year to the end of September next year, and then there'll be a second uh, year which will bring it to the end of September in 2018, and then there will be um, an enduring arrangement which will include short-term contracts for existing thermal plant but will include long-term contracts for new plants that would be built. Now, absolutely clear yet how long the long-term contracts will be, but that's the theory that there will be long-term contracts, specifically so that new plants will be able to be funded um, for that. I suppose the other thing that I didn't mention was that the, uh, the amount of money uh, in, the, in the market at the moment for system services or ancillary services traditionally has been about 60 million and it's been increased in the interim tariffs this year to about 70 or 80 million. But um, CER has agreed that by 2020 that can go up to 235 million. So it sees that there's going to be a movement away from um, energy and capacity uh, revenues for generators. Some of that will go into the, uh, into the ancillary services or the system services market. So particularly on the energy side you know the the, the 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 marginal cost should go down and i suppose the total cost of energy should go down too because there's less fuel you know and um, more of the energy has been provided um without having to pay fuel so the variable cost of energy will go down so you know some of to, to get to be able to get that benefit and get all those renewables in you need more system services so some of that money will go into the system services market Sure. No, I mean, absolutely take the point. And uh, I, I have no idea what the answer is. Uh, obviously, you have, to, you have to be optimistic and you know, have a kind of a business plan. Um, we have to wait and see, I guess. You know, um, like, uh, ideally, you would want a long term contract uh, in, in, in the energy market. And, and also, the generally EU approach in energy markets is, to, is, is looking to avoid long term contracts, you know, as a kind of a stitch up or something like that, you know. Uh, uh, and would, would it impact you dramatically if you were, say, if you were having with, with this technology or different, different uh, installations of this technology or people bought it from you, right? But would it impact on the, on the business model much if you were having, if the owners of the individual plants were having to kind of bid in on an annual or, or triannual basis or something like that? 
Well, obviously, it makes it more difficult to get funding if you don't have a secure long-term contract. And, I mean, I understand what the issue is about giving long-term contracts, that, that there is a concern that um, Airgrid would... Uh, would restrict itself by taking too much in long-term contracts at a price that may or may not turn out to be, um, you know, competitive. And I know that's what the issue is. Yeah. But there is no reason why Airgrid couldn't give a certain amount of long-term contracts, you know, in 2018 and more in 2019 or 2020, or maybe every second year or something like that. Sure. Where there's a certain amount that it, that that is fixed, and in fact, that provides some security of the costs to Airgrid because they know what they're going to be paying for it over a number of uh, and, and, and number of years. It's like a long term hedge contract. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I think that yeah hopefully yeah. answers that Thanks. question. Thank you. Duggan, Energy and Environment Division. Thanks very much. Uh, very interesting. Now the cynic in me would say that it's very appropriate to locate a high inertia plant in road. I'll say no more than that. But those who ever worked in road would know what I mean. Uh, the question, I, or two questions I have is, one is, can you describe the capacity of the plant in terms of megawatt seconds? And how does that compare with, say, a conventional unit at money point, where you're looking at 300 megawatts and maybe 1,500 megawatt seconds or something like that? And the second question is, Airgrid in their paper, nearly a hundred long, page long paper, on synthetic inertia placed a lot of emphasis on the, the, the time it took to actually determine that you had a, a frequency fall. And are you, yeah, what systems have you in place to determine that? And then following that lag, how fast can you respond? Okay. Um, it's taken the, the second question first. Um, we we monitor the system frequency, and um, we actually <coughs> we actually have in our algorithms we have a number of algorithms. Is just monitoring what the system frequency is, and as it falls, you know, through our algorithm, we'll say it's now reached a certain point, and therefore we want to start injecting, or it has reached some critical trigger point, and we now want to go what we call full blast and give a full blast output, and the uh, uh, through the Yokogawa control system that actually works very quickly so uh, i know that there's a, a concern about how do you know exactly what the system frequency is doing and how quickly can you monitor that but our experience is that you can monitor it actually very rapidly and that that the uh, the, the rate of change of frequency we have a separate algorithm for rate of frequency which overrides the other one and will give a, a a full blast for a certain length of time and then it reverts back to the whatever algorithm it was running on so that after a number of seconds if the system frequency is still low it will continue with whatever output is appropriate for that particular system frequency um, on, on your first question in terms of megawatt seconds i can't remember what the answer to that is i, I did some calculations at the beginning it really was overtaken by the requirement the, the, the requirement was defined by how quickly can you respond rather than by the number of of, um, of megawatt seconds and we can we can respond in and be up to to full output in well under one second um, and we can sustain that for five minutes so uh, th you know that gives an indication of the the stored energy and how long we can sustain it if the system frequency remains low for that period Oh, sorry. Each 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 flight wheel is 160 kilowatts. So in our demonstration project, we only have 320 kilowatts of that, and another 160 kilowatts of um, uh, of um, of battery. But uh, Beacon have two plants running in the United States, each of 20 megawatts. So they just have, you know, a few hundred um, flight wheels, and they have them in clusters of 10. And um, so it's it's completely scalable and you know we could put in 20 megawatts or 50 megawatts and we have we have planning permission in road for for 20 megawatts which we would connect into the dairy iron um, 110 kv station which is just over the other side of the hedge um from the old road power station and um i worked in for band so i know what you're talking about <laughs>
Good evening, uh, Peter Roach, XESBI. Uh, it was a very interesting paper both of you presented, so thank you for that. Um, I have a few points to, to make. Um, one is, <laughs> I'll get it off my chest, I have a patent for the utilization of flywheels using DC links, uh, but that patent has expired many decades ago. <laughs> but the concept developed in the 1960s of having a high-speed flywheel and using DC-DC converters to interconnect to a 50 or 60 hertz system. Um, but just to come down to uh, some of the issues that uh, Jerry raised there about the speed of response, um, certainly DC links, which is the conversion from energy to spinning energy to uh, electrical 50 hertz energy, um, the speed of response can be extremely fast. Yeah. You can go from kind of zero power to full power within kind of number of tens of milliseconds. Yeah. So there's no problem following a particular frequency swing. And typically, the frequency swing in a power system is about two to three hertz. You don't get any higher frequencies than that. Well, after a couple of uh, milliseconds, it's normally two to three hertz. So the flywheel can easily follow that. And um, I was involved in the design of a stabilization system uh, in Canada where a, a large DC link was being employed to feed hydro energy into the, the Canadian system. I think the energy content of that DC link was 2,000 megawatts, something like that, but that's not the issue. The issue really is that modulation on top of that 2,000 megawatts produced a, a very effective stabilization of system frequency, even of a very large system frequency. So if you injected a few megawatts at the right interval, a few megawatts even, you could damp out swings very quickly. So the uh, ability to, to stabilize is, is marked. Um, just a few other thoughts. One issue that arises is, as your flywheel has its energy extracted, or indeed is speeding up, um, one side of the DC conversion is operating at very strange frequencies, anything from kind of 25 hertz up to 50 hertz as it speeds up. And the harmonics that arise in that case are just horrendous, and they can do awful things. So perhaps AirGrid are, are wise in being a little bit careful on how they connect the system to the network, because harmonics can be uh, quite a, a problem. Um, yeah, I suppose the final remark or question I would put to you is, have you any idea in terms of megawatt seconds what kind of gross energy required by the, the network should be available within, say, the time frame of a few seconds to produce the stabilization? Are you talking about a number of tens of kilowatt hours or dozens of you know, megawatt hours, which determines how many type of uh, stabilizers of the form you're designing might be needed? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that last question, I suppose, is nearly more a question for for AirGrid as to what their requirement is, and they uh, they haven't actually come out yet with the requirement uh, for the, uh, the the volumes they want of the various system services, except that they do indicate that the additional system services they need are really at the sort of fast response end, the fast frequency response and synthetic inertia. Um, but um, I don't have a figure for exactly how many seconds is is actually required um, maybe that's available and I just haven't uh, got it yet you know in, in in answer to Jerry's question I started looking at that initially and then I went away from it right Okay. Yeah, that, that, that number actually slightly rings a bell from <laughs> what I did earlier on. If I could add to that perhaps, that the rest of the system is producing some form of spinning reserve. So th all the, the other synchronous machines are contributing to this, um, their, their kinetic energy to, to stopping the frequency falling. So all of the response needn't come from stored energy such as the flywheel or the battery. Uh, a lot of it is coming from the rest of the system plant. It is, and I suppose the point is that there's less and less of that conventional plant as there's more and more renewables on. So uh, at the moment, uh, 
Well, up to about a year ago, AirGrid was um, restricting the penetration of non-synchronous generation to 50% of the total uh, instantaneously, and they raised that up to 55% uh, this year. Um, but they need to get it up to 75%, uh, they reckon, to be able to accommodate the amount of uh, renewable energy in the system that's required to meet the 2020 targets. So, uh, you know, uh, that means that only only a, only a quarter of the, the, the plant would actually be um, conventional plants that's providing the inertia at the moment. So whether that means we need 1,500 megawatt seconds, I don't know, maybe that's, it's a more complicated uh, answer than that. We might just take one or two more, this gentleman. Um, <coughs> Sean O'Callaghan from Electronic and Electrical Engineering in Trinity College. Uh, just first of all to say I think that the Innovation is very good. I think you know, the future is very bright for this sort of technology, particularly because, as you're saying, old thermal plant is, is going to go the way of the dodo in the next 50 years, in my estimation anyway, with the advent of microgeneration and an awful lot of microgrid storage. I think the future is very bright. Um, you mentioned that you're using lead batteries here, that you use flow batteries and lithium in other places. Um, I was just wondering if you're in a position to comment a little further on the, the reasons behind the selection of the battery and if you've given any consideration to using the impending mass amounts of end-of-life electrical vehicle batteries which are going to come into the marketplace now in the next you know five to ten years uh, yeah I, it's a big question that whole question of batteries and what batteries you use um, one of the reasons why we use lead acid in this case is because lead acid light uh, well first of all lead acid is restricted in the number of cycles but that's not a problem for this application it would be a problem in in a, in, a, in in some other markets um, secondly lead acid likes to be um, f kept pretty fully charged whereas i think lithium ion prefers to be around 70 percent charged um, so if you have lithium ion in this and you, you, you want to keep it at only 70% charged, then you only have 70% of the capacity and you're only going to be paid 70% of what you would be paid if you were 100% charged. Um, it depends too on, on whether um, you are only looking at, say, out to TOR1 or TOR2, that would be f um, 5 minutes or 20 minutes, where you don't need a lot of storage and what you really need is power. Um, and again, um, you know, uh, well, either um, lithium ion or uh, lead acid is good for that, and you wouldn't use flow batteries for that. Whereas, if it was, if the application was um, with, uh, say, a lot of wind, where you know, some days it's windy, some days it's not, and if you wanted to be able to, um, and 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 if. The, the, the wind energy sufficiently drove the marginal cost um, then what you would want to do is store some of that energy and then be able to um, sell it into the market at a time when there was very little wind and the price was higher and in a case like that then something like flow batteries would be very good because they really come into their own in terms of economics when you uh, have maybe three or four hours or more of storage so you know, it just depends on now. Does I'm, there's a whole range of other batteries? I'm not an expert in batteries. Um, Dr. Robert Lynch in in uh, in UL is our expert on the batteries, and he's part of that project. Okay, just one more. I think this gentleman none came in online. Hi. Uh, thanks very much, Pat Dowling from ESB. A uh, very quick question. Um, as you're both um, a demand customer taking up electricity from the grid and with an MEC you're exporting, what kind of input have you had from CER in terms of how you will be assessed under the whole new world of DS3 that be done through the likes of non-group processing applications or what kind of feedback have you had from CER on this? Uh. Well, yes, we're, we're, we're both a demand customer and also we're a generator. Um, our MEC is higher than our MIC, so that we're, um, we're regarded like an auto generator. Um, we, one of the problems we have, uh, we have is that we're hit with um, a very high PSO um, levy, 
which um, half of our, our cost of el uh, el electricity is actually the PSO levy. Um, and so even if we even if we shut down the machines, we'd still have, be paying <laughs> half our electricity bills. Um, in in terms of the, the the gate process for connection, I think was what your question was. Um, CR came out uh, about a year ago, or sometime towards the end of last year, um, with a paper about um, connections, connection processes, with uh, suggestions for connection processes and changing to the the, the, the current gate process. And in it is recommended that um, there would be uh, that uh, that plants that was being uh, connected for DS3 services would be outside of the gate process, so that we wouldn't have to get into a queue with with more and more wind and more and more PV to provide the sort of uh, services that are, that is required, so that they can get on. Thank you. Yeah. One more, maybe. Still yeah, sorry. Uh, just follow, uh, James Tide from ESB. Uh, following on from John's question regarding uh, sort of uh, lifetime of contracts. Uh, you and you mentioned earlier the EFR in the UK with uh, uh, 200 megawatts, give or take, of uh, lithium-ion battery projects, uh, new build were, uh, or contracts for them were awarded by National Grid uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, the prices came out for that at between, I think it was between seven and 12 uh, pounds per megawatt per hour. Yeah, that's right. Um, how do you see that price? Uh, it's probably a bit higher than the interim tariffs from Airgrid. Uh, and how do you see that uh, compared to the costs you're seeing for your equipment? Uh, uh, how, how do you see how do you see the future? Do, are those are those prices uh, Are they are they generous or are they very lean? <laughs> okay. Um. The, uh, the, the people that bid into the EFR in, in, in Great Britain, the, that is not the only revenue stream they will have. So they bid in a price for what they get in the EFR. They can also get other re revenue streams. They can get revenue streams from the, um, the triads um, by being there and uh, uh, being able to reduce the demand over the peak. Uh, the, the use of system charge that's uh, charged on suppliers or retailers in, in, in GB, uh, a huge proportion of that is what is the contribution, or what is the, the demand of that supplier as, as a percentage of the total over the three highest peaks of the year, which generally are over the winter time. Um, now, you don't know until the end of the year what the three highest peaks are, um, but uh, the suppliers over there have a huge incentive to get their customers to reduce their demand over what they think may end up being the three highest peaks. Okay, so what they'll do is they'll call on on these plants. The, these lithium-ion batteries will actually export onto the grid over the say two two and a half hours over the peaks of the days end up being a triad, and they will be paid by the supplier to do that, right? So that's an additional revenue stream that they can get um, over and above what they're providing for, um, on e what they'll get on EFR. And the third one is that there is a, um, a capacity mechanism payment that again, um, they will be paid for uh, being available on the odd day that the peaks are very high or that there's a shortage of plant. Um, and and the uh, the national grid will call on those generators to generate over those periods and um, to be in that mechanism is is quite a big revenue stream as well. So the EFR and the twelve um, uh, I can't remember was it twelve pounds per megawatt or twelve euro um, is only a proportion of the total revenue that that that, that they will get. So without knowing how big the revenues are on the other ones, and we haven't done those sums yet, I don't know exactly whether you know 12 is sufficient or not. The only other information that I have is that people who bid on the basis of being able to get the revenue back over the four years bid in prices that were multiples of 12. 
So those people that bid in, they bid in on the basis that they were take, they had deep and they could take a risk that at the end of the four years they would get an, another another contract and um, they were willing to take that they were willing to take that risk. Now it may be that the people who bid in um, multiples were not taking into account the revenue streams that they could get from triads and the the um, the, um, the capacity mechanism. So I don't know that there's a convoluted answer, but um, I got one in on the webcast. So we've got to ask that one from James Mahan at RNS Limited, and he asks, "Why did you call it Schungrad Energy? Are you pretending to be Danish or German?" <laughs> <laughs> um, the answer is yes. Um, <laughs> it's a it's a it's an Irish company, but the guy who set it up uh, thought at the time that it would be very good to have a, a German name. It kind of gave a, a, a certain. Um, uh, kind of uh, solidity to it and people had uh, belief in German engineering and um, honesty and integrity and all that sort of stuff until uh, Volkswagen got caught out. So I'm not sure would you make the same, um, the same decision now. But yes, it's an, it's an Irish company with a German name. Very good. Um, I won't be uh, long more. Um, I just want to again thank uh, Frank and Don Burke for a very interesting discussions. Um, and uh, if we can express our gratitude again, <laughs> uh, um, just very quickly, uh, just to note that the presidential address there is uh, going ahead in Engineers Ireland on the 29th, where Dermot Byrne. Um, we'll be talking about, um, I suppose, his uh, view and vision there for, for the year. And he's titled that uh, Ireland's Energy Challenge, a personal perspective. So that looks uh, like an interesting discussion as well. Um, but just watch out, there's pre-registration required for that. But that's on the, the 29th. Uh, in terms of uh, the Electrical Electronic Division, we have another talk um, scheduled for the 13th of October in Clyde Road. And it's titled Sigfox Nationwide Telemetry where uh, it's lowering bar barriers to, uh, for wide implementation of Internet of Things of solutions, which we, we saw in Don's uh, um, presentation there tonight. So uh, I'll just bring the, the evening to a close. Very much thank you for your tonight. Cheers. Thank you.